Hey guys, this is Landon with the Command Valley, bringing to you another Monday EDH Deck Tech episode. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, and I am super excited for this week's Commander. So this week's Commander is one I am personally very excited by for several reasons. First off, the art is absolutely beautiful, and I have a soft spot in my heart for this particular tribe, and that is Svalin of Sea and Sky. Like I said, my I have a little bit of a soft spot in my heart for Merfolk. That was one of like the first five decks I built was a Q mana deck, which was just a super aggro blue green merfolk deck and that deck was so much fun so i am super excited to be building a mono blue version of the merfolk tribal deck and i think svalin is a super powerful commander so she is a legendary creature merfolk god and she costs one a blue and a blue and she has some really cool abilities so she has indestructible as long as you control at least two other merfolk and whenever she attacks, you get to draw a card. And other merfolk that we control have ward one, meaning whenever a merfolk we control becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, it is countered unless they pay an additional one generic mana in addition to the other costs for that ability or spell. So she has a lot kind of built into her. She's got indestructible, so she's pretty good if we want to go the Voltron route. She gives us cards when she attacks, and she gives some protection to all of our other merfolk. She's really doing a lot of really good stuff here. Also, her stat line being a 3-4 for 3 mana is really cool. So the strategy of this deck is going to be pretty straightforward. This is a tempo merfolk tribal deck, so we're really just trying to spew out a lot of merfolk and swing in for the win. We're trying to overrun our opponents with these cool little fishies. And I would say the power level for this deck, if you're interested in, in that type of metric, is probably around the five to six range. In tribal decks, without a lot of the really expensive cards like Coat of Arms and Vanquisher's Banner and, and stuff like that, usually aren't too potent. You'll see more when we get into the video. And the budget for this, I've kept it to about a hundred dollar budget. Some of the cards in this list are a little expensive. I think people are really hyped about the Merfolk and I think that these prices will go down over time. So about a hundred dollar budget. So let's get into the list. Let's start off with what merfolks are most known for, and that is their wide amount of lords. So we've got cards like Lord of Atlantis that are going to give all of our merfolk plus one, plus one, and Island Walk. So there are a lot of the other lords will give all of our merfolk a plus one, plus one buff in addition to Island Walk or some other type of ability. For example, Merfolk Sovereign is going to give them all plus one, plus one, and we can tap to make a merfolk that we control unblockable this turn. We've also got Coral Helm Commander, which has the level up mechanic and it doesn't pump all of our other merfolk until it's level four but it does only cost one generic mana to level it up so that for four mana getting four mana to get a lord well i guess four mana to level it up and then two mana to cast it so six mana total still is a pretty good rate We've also got Master of the Pearl Trident, which is basically a functional reprint of Lord of Atlantis. We've also got Meryl Regery, which whenever we cast a Merfolk spell allows us to tap or untap a permanent, which could be really useful. We could use it to untap a mana rock, untap a land, maybe tap down a potential blocker. There's a lot of really cool things we can do with this. We've also got Sage of Fables, which is an interesting Lord in this deck. It only puts plus one plus one counters on wizards as they enter the battlefield, but a lot of merfolks are actually wizards as well. And then we can pay two mana to remove a counter from a creature we control to draw a card. So those are all of the true lords that we're playing in the deck. I also threw in a glass pool mimic, which is a shapeshifter. We can have it enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature we control, or we can play it down as a land, but it's in the deck so we can play it as a copy of maybe one of our lords so we can get two. So that's pretty useful. All right, and in addition to having a wide array of really useful lords, Merfolk also have a lot of really difficult creatures to block or really aggressive creatures. So we've got Merfolk like River Sneak, which cannot be blocked. And whenever any other Merfolk enters the battlefield under our control, the Sneak is gonna get plus one, plus one until the end of turn. If we have this out when we have our Deep Root Waters, which gives us a Merfolk every single time we cast a Merfolk spell, and they also get Hexproof, or our Reflections of Le Yara, which basically doubles all of the Merfolk that we're casting, the River Sneak can get really big really quickly. We've also got a Tempest Caller, which when it ETBs is going to tap all creatures target opponent controls, kind of like a one-sided board wipe really, but we're kind of going wide. So being able to tap down all of our opponent's blockers is really useful. We've also got True Name Nemesis, which is super difficult for one player to deal with. We can give it protection from a chosen player when it ETBs. We've also got Triton Shorewalker, which also just cannot be blocked, kind of like the River Sneak. So when we've got a bunch of Lords in play pumping this up, this can get pretty lethal pretty quickly. We've also got Wake Thrasher, which doesn't really have any evasion on its own, but we have lots of ways in this deck of giving it that 
evasion that it needs but whenever a permanent weak control becomes untapped weight thrasher is going to get plus one plus one until the end of turn this counts our creatures this counts our lands our artifacts i cannot tell you how many games i won with weight thrasher in my og q mana deck this card does so much work and losing green kind of does hurt the merfolk strategy we do lose a lot of like the overrun effects and the protection abilities but what i love about commander is you don't always have to be playing the most optimal colors for your strategy it's really just about having fun and i think that this deck looks like a ton of fun the commander is super cool and it's just a really flavorful fun deck now we've got a bunch of other merfolk in this list that give us just a lot of value or just otherwise just a really good utility creature we've got thieving skydiver which has kicker x and when it enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, we can gain control of target artifact with converted mana cost X or less. If that artifact is an equipment, we can also attach it right onto Thieving Skydiver. So this is really good at stealing maybe a sort of the Animus, sort of, you know, Feast and Famine, stealing a Soul Ring, stealing, you know, any type of artifact when it ETBs. It's just a super powerful ability. We've also got Tower Man, Sky Summoner. We are playing a decent amount of instant and sorcery spells, so being able to make a 2-2 Drake with flying for that is really important. We've also got Stony Book Branneret, which has Island Walk itself and makes all of our Merfolk and Wizard spells cost one less to play. Sithal Tracer is one of the more expensive merfolk, but does a lot of work. It has an activated ability with a cost of one, a blue, and tapping two untapped wizards we control. We can copy target instant or sorcery spell and choose new targets for the copy. Now this is super cool because we don't have to just copy our instant or sorcery spells. We can target our opponents too. And since we are playing a lot of wizards, this is really easy to achieve. And we are definitely playing some instants and sorcery spells that we would love to copy. Now, Seafloor Oracle is a really good payoff. Whenever a merfolk that we control deals damage to a player, we get to draw a card. Salvager of Secrets is a little on the pricey side, but when the ETBs, we can return target instant or sorcery card from our graveyard to our hand. Riverwise Augur brainstorms when it comes into play, which is a useful ability to have as well. Merfolk Harbinger, when it enters the battlefield, lets us search our library for a Merfolk card, shuffle our library, and then we get to put that Merfolk card on top of our library. This is really good at tutoring up one of our lords, or maybe Talrand if we've got a lot of instants and sorceries in our hand and we want to cast them, or maybe Seafloor Oracle if we're needing to draw cards. Now, Merfolk Trickster is really cool. It has flash, and when it enters the battlefield, we get to tap target creature and opponent controls. It loses all abilities until the end of turn. This has so many uses. Being able to tap down maybe a big old Drazi before it swings at us and annihilates us, or being able to tap down a really problemsome blocker, or shutting off our opponent's commander for a turn. Maybe they're playing Corvald and they're about to go off. We can tap them down, and they're just going to lose all of the abilities for that turn. It can kind of be like a mini time walk if you really want to be that generous. Master of Waves is one of my personal favorite merfolk. It has protection from red and pumps all elementals we control by plus one plus one. And when it ETBs, we make a number of one zero blue elemental creature tokens equal to our devotion to blue. Our commander has two blue pips in its mana cost and this has one. So when it ETBs, if we have our commander out, it's gonna make three elementals total, which isn't bad. That's six power for just having our commander in this but we do have a lot of colored pips among mana costs of our merfolk so i've been able to pull off you know anywhere between 10 to 20 elemental creature tokens made when i play my master of waves now little mage mentor is one merfolk that i've never actually been able to play and i'm super excited to see how it works in this deck whenever a spell or ability we control counters a spell we can put a 1-1 blue merfolk creature token onto the battlefield we can then tap seven untapped merfolk we control to counter a spell we're not super heavy on counter spells there are some in the deck but this is more of a tempo deck it's not really a control deck but we are very capable of making a ton of merfolk tokens and just spewing those out so it probably won't take long to where Lol mage mentor can tap down enough merfolk we control to just start countering spells this also has a lot of really good synergy with merfolk with uh, marrow commerce at the end of our turn we get to untap all of the merfolk we control so that works really well if we want to tap out you know play a bunch of merfolk maybe cast some spells but still want to be able to untap our creatures to use the Lol Mage Mentor's ability to counter, you know, maybe a board wipe or an opponent trying to combo off or something. So that's some really good synergy within the deck. We've also got a really simple card draw uh, Merfolk here, Library Larcenist. Whenever it attacks, we get to draw a card. I figured it's probably worth a slot. Three mana is a little expensive, but if we can get it down early and start attacking with it, you know, drawing two cards per turn with our commander in this isn't necessarily the worst. Kopala Warden of Waves is similar to our commander in that it gives all of our merfolk technically ward 2. 
Um, so whenever they try and cast a spell that targets a merfolk we control, it's going to cost two more. And the same goes with abilities. Harbinger of Tides, we can pay an extra two generic mana for if we want to cast that instant speed. And when it ETBs, we can return target tap creature and opponent controls to its owner's hand. Now, Fallow Sage is an interesting one. Whenever it becomes tapped, we can draw a card. So whether we're attacking with it or tapping it down to the Low Mage Mentor or any other tap effect that we can think of, maybe our opponents tap it down, we get to draw a card for that. And then finally, the last Merfolk we are playing is Curse Catcher. We can counter target instant or sorcery spell unless its controller pays one if we sacrifice the Curse Catcher. I can't tell you how many times this little Merfolk really has to make an opponent think twice about casting any type of instant or sorcery spell. It, it's just a really good gotcha card. Now, those are all the merfolk that we're playing. Let's go over the ways in the deck we have of drawing cards. So we've got a chart, of course, which is a simple draw spell. We get to draw two cards for two mana and then discard a card unless we attack the creature this turn. Uh, we're basically going to be swinging out with a creature every turn. So two mana for two cards is definitely worth an include in this deck. And then we have Distant Melody, which is a little bit more pricey at four mana, but we choose a creature type and draw a card for each permanent we control of that type. Obviously, this is super good in a tribal deck and it can oftentimes be four mana to draw eight cards, which is a super good rate. We are also playing a Windfall because wheels are fun. And then we are playing a simple Brainstorm. I just like to put Brainstorm in the decks that I build. Instant speed, one mana, draw three cards and put two back on top. Super powerful. We are also playing a Reconnaissance Mission, which lets us draw a card every single time one of our creatures deal combat damage to a player, or we can just cycle it away if we draw it super early on and don't have the mana to play it, or if for whatever reason we just don't need it. We're also playing a Bident of Thassa, which is very similar. Whenever a creature we control deals combat damage to a player, we can draw a card. It also has an activated ability of paying two in a blue and tapping it to make our creatures attack this turn if able. And I am also playing Solve the Equation. It is a super good tutor and it is pretty budget. Two in a blue, we can search our library for an instant or sorcery and put it into our hand. It can find us a windfall if we need it, maybe a counter spell if we know a big turn is coming from our opponents. It can find us an interaction piece. It is mostly in the deck so we can find our right of replication. Right of replication for four mana makes a token copy of a creature we control or we can kick it for five mana. So nine mana total, we make five tokens of that creature instead, which is really good to put on a lord. Now let's go over the ways we have in this deck of interacting with our opponents. So we've got a couple board wipes with Spectral Deluge, which for four blue blue, we return each creature our opponents control with toughness XLS to its owner's hand where X is the number of islands we control. We can also foretell it for one blue blue and then pay two mana on a later turn to cast it. Being able to pay three mana to bounce most of our opponent's creatures is so good. And we're also playing an Aetherize, which can bounce all attacking creatures to their owner's hands. We are also playing some counter spells with counter spell, Familiar's Ruse, which we have to return a creature to our hands to counter a spell, which isn't a huge deal. We've got Mystic Confluence, which has a bunch of different modes. We can counter a spell unless it's controller pays three, return target creature to its owner's hand, or draw a card. This kind of does it all, and we can choose three modes, and we can choose the same mode more than once. We've also got a Negate, which is just a really good catch-all non-creature counterspell. And we've also got a Wizard's Retort, which is essentially a second copy of Counterspell as we mostly have Wizards. Now, we do have some spot removal with Snap, being able to bounce a creature and untap two of our lands, essentially making it free. We've got Resculpt, which is a really good instant speed exile artifact or creature spell. Reality Shift, which is a super good exile target creature spell. Rapid Hybridization and Pongify basically do the same thing. They turn a really big scary creature into a not so scary creature for a little amount of mana. And we also have Imprisoned in the Moon to deal with creatures, lands, or planeswalkers, turning them into a useless colorless land. And then finally, the another piece of interaction we have, finishing off the instance and sorcery interaction, is Mystic Reflection. This lets us choose target non-legendary creature, and the next time one or more creatures or planeswalkers enter the battlefield, this turn they enter as copies of the chosen creature. Now, this spell is super versatile. It can be used in a multitude of ways. It can be used defensively, being able to turn our opponent's big creature that they're trying to put into play into some type of random 1-1 merfolk token or like a Llanowar elves or basically it can turn a big scary creature that would come into play as something super non-imposing. It can also turn all of the merfolk tokens that we're making off of deep root waters into copies of our lords which is super powerful so I really like that flexibility in this deck. 
Now there is one more card that I would like to talk about before I go into the ramp and the utility lands, and that is Throne of the God Pharaoh. At the beginning of our end step, each opponent is going to lose life equal to the number of tapped creatures we control. We are very, we are a very aggressive deck, and we are planning on swinging out very frequently. And the fact that this can deal damage to each of our opponents, while we only have to focus our damage on one opponent, is really useful. And I thought for a second this might be kind of a Nambo with Meryl Commerce, but they both trigger at the beginning of our end step, so we can stack them in such a way that the Throne of the God Pharaoh goes off first and then the Meryl Commerce will resolve. Now going into the ramp, I won't talk about this too much. This deck is super low to the ground. Our commander is only three mana and most of our spells aren't very expensive. I am playing a high tide since we are playing about 25, 26 islands. It's just a no brainer. We've also got Arcane Signet, Everflowing Chalice, Felwar Stone, Mind Stone, Pillar of Origins, Sky Diamond, and of course a Soul Ring. And we are playing some really good utility lands. I threw in a Myriad Landscape to get us extra lands, a Mystic Sanctuary to get instants and sorceries back, Riptide Laboratory to reset some of our wizards or protect our wizards from being destroyed, a Rogue's Passage, which is probably the best land in the deck. Uh, it can make a creature that we control unblockable, and it's the reason why I have put in Teleria West into this deck. Also, Teleria West historically has been a super expensive spell, and it just got reprinted, so I think people should be picking that up. Uh, it has Transmute for one blue blue, so we can discard it and search our library for any land, and always having access to Rogue's passage is never a bad thing especially when this deck is also playing a land like scavenger grounds um being able to just have a way to tutor for graveyard hate or an unblockable ability is super useful another card that i think is super cool is svelanite temple it comes into play tap and we can tap it to add a blue but we can also sacrifice it to add two blue to our mana pool so i kind of like that acceleration and with that, this episode is coming to a close. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode. I hope you build and play this deck and have as much fun playing the Merfolk Tribe as I do. Like I said at the beginning of the video, I really love the Merfolk Tribe. It's so much fun to play. It kind of feels like Elf Ball, but you have a lot more tricks up your sleeve. And it's one of those tribes that gets stronger and stronger every single time a set comes out. They're always printing new and fun Merfolk. So it's a deck that you can build and always be finding tools for throughout the years. It's just a lot of fun. I'd like to give a super huge shout out to our subscribers and our patrons for this channel. You guys mean a lot to us and we really couldn't do this without you. If you are interested in becoming a patron, you can do so by heading on over to patreon.com slash commandvalley today. We'll have a link for that in the description of this video. You'll get access to our Discord, merch, playing games with us, and a bunch of extra perks, and we have a ton of fun over on our Discord server. Again, thank you guys so much for watching this week's EDH Deck Tech episode, and I hope you guys have a wonderful week week.